Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Beers and Bites with your co-hosts. Let me see. Oh, what? Oh, Chris Jordan of Pussy Security and Jeremy Murdashaw of 45, 24 by 7. And with us this week is Glenn Chisholm, who is the CEO and co-founder of Obsidian Security. Now, what really intrigues me is I really love this one-liner. Obsidian delivers frictionless SaaS security with the industry's first cloud detection and response solution. I mean, while that might sound like a mouthful, it's really intriguing and what it means. And I hope that during this session, you'll be just as intrigued as I am to understand a little bit more of what that means. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn the meeting over uh, to the guys. And if you would, Chris, before we introduce Glenn, let's start showing off the beers. All right, all right. So I, I'm going with another three notch. I'm, even, I'm not a Who fan. Nice juicy IPA. This one's got a mango tropical orange to it. Actually, it's um, like a, this is called King of the Clouds. Um, it's kind of a walk in the clouds. It's a really good one. Uh, I accidentally drank two of them the other night by mistake when I was testing them. And then I got my solace, my basic solace, uh, which is a partly cloudy. Uh, they, they, they started actually putting into my local grocery store now, so I can start, uh, I don't have to travel as far to get them anymore. So what we're going to start going, I'm going to open my up. All right, Jeremy, man, go ahead and shoot. So I've got the uh, Lucky Luke Brewing, uh, Luke's original. It's a uh, American Blonde. My backup is this new uh, Bravery Brewing El Valentine. It's a uh, aged porter, 12 months in bourbon barrels, finished with Peruvian coffee. What's on the 11.3 percent. Wow, and it's got this cool like sloth dude on the machete <laughs> sloth guy on the front. I think. <laughs> Maybe we lost your day. That's it. Yeah, hey, I want you to show them your crappy beer that you got at the truck stop. So, so I went to, yes, it was a truck stop. And the only thing that they had in the cooler that was not Bud Light and stuff like that was this thing called King Cobra. It's a premium malt liquor. And that's, <laughs> that's in a nice 40 ounce bottle. <laughs> okay. So if I'd, if I'd known where we we're going to go, Edward Scissorhand, Edward 40 hands, then that's a totally different discussion. Like, that sort of oh changes the whole dimension uh, of this discussion. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed. Al, have, Al, have you ever had that? It is horrible. He's about to find out. <laughs> Agreed. I've never had it. If you, if you no can get, get through that is. entire 40, if you can get through that 40, I'll be impressed. <laughs> I, I might just switch it out for my Bud Light in the middle. I mean, the, con the concern is not if he can get through the 40. The concern is if he can style white, we'll get him through the 40. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. All right, Glenn, why don't you show us your beer? What do you got, bro? Oh, I didn't know that I had to be, I didn't know that I had to be fancy. So I, I decided to, as Australian, I decided to be multicultural. <laughs> and, and I mean, in all fairness, there are people that confuse, you know, Australia is south of the border, so... There you go. Uh, All right. This is how we've been surviving COVID is uh, drinking, have these little get togethers. So for sure. <laughs> so, so with that, uh, Glenn, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how the company got started uh, uh, with you and Ben. And then uh, from there, we'll just start opening up for a general discussion. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd been working, um, uh, at Silence with uh, Stuart McLaurin, Ryan Perma, who, who, who uh, you know, built that company up, you know, so I, we started when there was a bunch of us around the dinner table in Vegas and, you know, we got to a certain point and, um, and I sort of thought, well, it's time to go do something else. Um, you know, that was, that was a great company. It was growing really well. It was, you know, uh, super, super well run and they were, you know, everyone was having a lot of fun. So I thought, well, I can go and do something else. And uh, I decided to, to, to head off and, and it was funny because, you know, I was chatting to a friend of mine and uh, it was basically uh, uh, after, I'd, after I'd left and, and he said to me, you know, you should talk to, to Ben Johnson. And I was like, okay. And Ben Johnson was, you know, the CTO at a competitor, which is, you know, carbon black. And uh, I was like, okay, I can chat to Ben. And, you know, we chatted and, you know, I realized that we'd both sort of independently come to the decision to go do something else. And, and so we just, we chatted for a while. We sort of thought about things that interested us and we talked about security. We talked about, 
you know, tooling and the market and, and, you know, what problems interested us and, you know, uh, the nature of what we wanted to do next. And we decided we'd, we'd go do something together with, with the third co-founder, which is, which is Matt Wolf. And so the three of us sort of got together and pulled the thing together and, and, uh, and, and started on our merry way. And that was like mid 2017. So we're, we're a bit over three years now. And was the, did you have the idea right off the bat or you just were rebellious at the bat? Were you like a bunch of pirates leaving and, you, you know, sailing around figuring out what to do or did you get together and you guys kicked it out and said, okay, let's do this? No, we, 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 as I said, we independently decided to go do something else. We just didn't necessarily know what that was. Um, what we did know we, is we weren't going to go build another endpoint because, mm. you know, he'd, he'd built an endpoint, I'd built an endpoint. It was a lot of fun, you know. You know, um, it was a really active market. You know, when we started out in that space, you know, it hadn't really had a lot of innovation in a long time. And then you had this huge influx of people trying to do interesting things and silence and CrowdStrike and Calm Black and Sentinel One. And, you know, over time, it fundamentally changed what an endpoint meant. And, you know, it's sort of the, the market shifts then, you know, you, you sort of move to, to more of a, you know, a customer acquisition phase and you move to sort of a, a building, a building out the size of your operation phase. And, you know, we just decided we we're going to do something different. And, um, and we wanted to get closer to the technology again. We wanted to be building again, we want to be building from scratch again, you know, and, and I'm sure you guys know building from scratch is, is, is a lot of fun. Great. Great. So, so, so just so everybody knows, why don't you tell, give us the, the 30 second elevator pitch of which company does. You know, we're focused on, on what we call cloud detection and response, which is effectively building a, a, a product that uh, provides um, uh, the security stack to allow one to understand uh, who's doing what in your cloud, applications, services, accounts, privileges, activity, configurations and being able to to bring that back to the security team in a way the security team can manage and respond to without having to be experts in all these different applications you know as we've moved to the cloud you know we've we've, we've had this fundamental change in the on-premise stack where we used to think about everything as devices and and endpoints and servers and firewalls and then as you move to these you know these cloud-oriented services this device orientation disappears and what you really end up with is more of an identity centric orientation because it's the identities that are performing the activities. And so as you move to this sort of more identity centric view of the world, you have to adjust your thinking, you have to adjust your stack, you have to adjust your capability and you have to have your tooling in place to do that. And so if you get the right tooling in place and you get the right mindset in place, then you can provide services that say, look, I used to be worried about running you know, CrowdStrike on my server that ran my mail spool. Well, now my mail spool is run by someone else. What I have to worry about, I have to worry about the authentication, the authorization, the activity. I have to worry about the configurations. I have to be able to build this picture and I have to be able to understand it holistically across the enterprise. Otherwise, I'm going to end up suffering a new type of breach, a new type of attack or a new type of problem. So that... Would I, what was your first version of the product? Like, did you like create a version of the product? And say, hey, that's the this is it, or did you come down to a different way and say, oh my gosh, this is not right. We got to do this. I mean, what was, is what you have right now? The first iteration of what you built, or did you have that magical West Coast? I'm going to pivot to create an MVP kind of company. No, I mean, it, it, it's funny. You know, we we looked at like the core elements you know, the other day that we really, that we really thought were important from a product perspective. And, you know, um, uh, I, I think that as we think about, you know, what we, as we thought about the problem, you know, you, you, you know, you have to do that traditional sort of design phase as you're thinking about the problem. It's like, you know, what, what are the key principles? You know, we wanted to, we wanted to, you know, be enterprise focused. We wanted to be focused on the cloud. We wanted to have low friction. We wanted to be, you know, provide visibility, response, and protection. You know, we wanted to be able to take action. We wanted to be API friendly, integration friendly, and you know, those are sort of like some core elements that we wanted to bring to the space, which is like not not another security product, not another three week rollout. 
you know, sorry, three month rollout, you know, not another piece of shelfware, not another, you know, there, there's all these things that you don't want to be. And so you sort of, you, you, you sort of have the sort of the core idea of what you want to give to the customer. And you have to have a lot of conversation with the customer. So like the very first thing you build, it's like, here's a shell of a user interface on, you know, on a set of data. And then you, you're talking to customers all the time. You're talking to people that may use your product, may buy your product, and you're starting to understand like what matters to them. And you, you're just building on top of that. So, so for an uninformed as myself, um, would I view what you do at Obsidian as an evolution or a revolution of the old CASB uh, uh, model? <laughs> you can answer that one, Glenn. Um, you know, I, 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 I think it's, um, it's a security oriented view of SaaS security. You know, what do we care about? We care about who does what, where, when, you know, what they're entitled to do, where they are, the privileges, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we, you need to have that protect, detect and respond capability. I think, you know, CASB came at this from a, the perspective of, um, I've lost my perimeter, my perimeter is gone. How do I get my perimeter back? And, you know, I think that that's the, that's the inherently reflective, re reflexive response that you get when a security control goes away, you would try and work out how to reposition that security control in another way. What you need to do is rethink what the capability that you need is and then build for that capability rather than trying to reposition the same security control in a different way. Got it. Um, and, and, you know, CASB provides, you know, a bunch of important services to people. I think we, we do something that's, that's really quite structurally different. Okay. Just, just so people listening understand, I mean, a CASB is... Uh... Uh, it's cloud access security broker. And the real idea is, is that, so a lot of people want to do like with the metrodome, um, it, breaking and step. They want to see what's inside a pipe and they want to evaluate it like the old network IDS. But CASB went one step beyond which said, I'm going to look at the exchange of data and almost be like a, a proxy firewall, but for, the, for the, the connection going out to these services. While you know, everybody else, like, you know, we're doing it from a different perspective, Glenn, obviously, but not too much, but, but collecting the data to have visibility into services, CASB was a guaranteed fail because you didn't always have to go through the CASB to get to the service, right? The, the true master of the service was the, was the cloud for provider itself, whether it's Office or Microsoft 365 or G Suites. So you had to get the, the logs from them, right? And, and that's true. I mean, we, I think where one thing that excited me, Glenn, when, you know, it scares me that we're, like we're in the same boat, but it excites me too, right? That we see that this is the new space. The new space is that the network's gone, right? Your infrastructure is now where your data is. And your data is in mobile devices, endpoints, it's in the cloud. And the idea of having, forcing users to change their route to go through a Z scale or, or a CASB is, is a dying idea because you're trying people to use the network like it's 1990, right? And the reality is, is that the way business works today is significantly changed. Now, that being said, one of the things that really shocked me dealing with cloud providers, and I'm, I'm talking the service side, not the AWS and the Azure and the Google Cloud, but it is seeing how crappy their audit logs really are, right? Um, I won't say Microsoft's name, but there's vendors out there that take over 24 hours before you get their logs, right? So you, you, you don't have the same real-time protection capability if they're not gonna send you their logs or if they don't even have a log to let you know they stripped a, a file from an email because you don't have the E5, C5 capabilities of their, of their filters, right? So, I mean, I, I mean, how are you dealing with that? I mean, the diversity of capability from one vendor to another, and I'm kind of yanking on Microsoft's leg because they're really, they should be good at this by now, right? But, but I'm finding there's vendors that they don't even know what IP address you came from when you logged into their web service, right? I mean, how are, how are you dealing with that being at the mercy of the, the logs of the cloud providers? So I suppose I, I suppose we come at this a slightly different way, which is, 
you know, we view everything as an API integration and we view everything as a mix of, of how we can interact with their APIs and how we can use their APIs to the fullest. Mm -hmm. um, and not to be contrarian with you, but you know, Microsoft is actually pretty decent in a lot of this. Um, and you know, the, the, the challenge is gonna be, the challenge in this space is, is, is look, there are always gonna be SaaS providers that have uh, a crappy API or crappy data. What that really comes down to is the customer making the decision that the risk that that instantiates to them is just unsustainable. Um, you know, the way that we think about it is, you know, you look at it, you look at the application on the other side of the table, you understand their APIs, you understand what you can do with them and how much you can do with them. Mm -hmm. And then you, you drive them to the fullest. And, <clears throat> and it's not just about, you know, can I get logs? It's how much can I get? What's the variance of the APIs? Can I build up, you know, webhooks? Can I get some information now and enrich it later? You know, can I think about the configurations that reduces risk to the organization? You know, it's the totality of the stack. You know, the comment that I make to people is, um, tell me what the reference architecture for SaaS security is. And if you, if, you, if you can't tell me what the reference architecture for SaaS security is, that's a problem. And I think the point is that people can't answer that question and therefore there is a problem. And the, the way that we've dealt with that problem is we've sort of tried to, we've tried to patch it with little bits here and the little bits there and a little bit from this application, a little bit from that application. I, I, I think that, you know, that um, there are some providers out there that, that simply don't understand security. But the, the, the key for security teams is to understand that there's, there's a fundamental change. And the first part of the change is there are IT tools that IT buys and shifts to the cloud. They might buy 365. It's a good product. They might buy it. It's, it's gonna be better for them to buy 365 and try and run it on premise. Like I think we can all agree that's probably true at this point. Well, they can buy, sorry, go ahead, man. No, it's I, less I expensive. The, only, the only caveat I was gonna say is, is that, you know, we buy products because they're useful to our business, right? So when you take a look at Office 365, we know Microsoft 365. It's a fantastic application for any size business, especially small businesses, considering that the total cost ownership is gonna be lower for any SaaS. In fact, SaaS is not the fact that, you know, by seat it might be more expensive, but the total cost ownership, when you think about, I don't have anybody to really manage my servers, right? That you're gaining a lot. But one of the things is you don't evaluate. I've never bought a SaaS service and looked at its audit log first, right? But yet to put security, to, to leverage these devices and do security for them, it's, it's amazing how bad some of the audit and the data coming from the SaaS really is. That we've got vendors that three, up to three years ago, there's an email vendor that actually transmitted all their audit logs the HTTP over port 80. Okay, so so you're you're talking about downloading people's attempt to type their correct password and be transmitting it in the clear. Um, I guess my point is is that you know, I I found this is one reason why I think this is a very important issue and reason why people should outsource the management of logs to these type of products is because there's a great learning curve between what audit's available for on-prem versus what audit is available for, for CASB, not CASB, but cloud, right? And, and that's the reason why I really think that this is a brilliant need across this. I think this is the reason why we're both in this space. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I, I think there's, there's two bits. Of, I'm not saying that you're, you're wrong, you, you're right. People buy SaaS applications for business reasons. IT might be by 365. IT doesn't buy Salesforce. That's bought by the CRO. You know, IT doesn't buy Workday. That's bought by HR. Who manages Salesforce? It's managed by the sales ops. Who manages Workday? It's managed by HR. So, you know, if you came to me 
you know, in 2015 and said to me, you know, well, how do we do authentication and all these cloud apps? They don't all support OAuth, you know, like, of course they didn't. What made them support OAuth is security said, this is a basic requirement of existence in our organization. And, you know, how do we get there? Well, we put tooling in place from an Okta or a Ping or whatever it happened to be, you know, Okta helped drive that market, create, you know, a, a centralized authentication process. They helped manage that. They helped sync with that with on-prem. They helped to turn that into a, a fundamentally better outcome. And quite frankly, a fundamentally better outcome than most people had on-prem before. And then when you say stuff like, hey, well, look, you know, you shifted this application, the audit logs are better on-prem maybe than they are in the cloud. Well, I kind of dispute that to a certain extent because a lot of these applications weren't even being looked at properly when they're on-prem. So, you know, it's like, it, it's, it, it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, uh, the, the, you know, A was better than B, but I, I have no idea what happened with A. Because when I, had, when, when I was doing on A, I was managing it myself. I was worried about the operating system. I was worried about the endpoint. And what I was worried about was patching the thing. Okay. Now I've given up all of those problems. I've made the Microsoft's problem or Salesforce's problem. And I understand that they've got a highly efficient, highly you know, uh, managed, well-run process to deal with all of these things. Mm -hmm. Now I need to worry about what the higher value functions are. And as I go to those higher value functions, it's like, look, you know, you can passively receive a set of log content or you can actively look for what you need to understand from the application and reach in and grab it. If you reach in and grab it, you're going to get more. You're going to have a richer understanding. That requires you as a security vendor to have a deeper understanding of the application. But that's the cost of doing business. What you're doing as the security vendor is you're taking that responsibility onto yourself taking the load off the security team. Hang on, this sounds like any other SaaS service. What am I doing? I'm taking on certain functions because we can perform them more efficiently than you can internally at a scale. So we take those functions on and we let you shift to the higher value functions. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's what we should be doing. You know, and, and you know, we become the experts in a series of things for you and you then can, can focus on what matters. We can, you know, we can give you the tooling to run threat hunting in the cloud, run detection and response in the cloud. Answer the question, what did Chris Jordan do last Tuesday across all of his SaaS applications? What is the implication of that? You know, which is something, you know, like if you think about this, this is roughly analogous to the EDR market. You know, before you had EDR, what did you say? Okay, like, hey, I need to know what Chris did on his laptop. I go get his laptop. I go get guidance. I image his laptop. I try and forensically reconstruct what happened. I pull my hair out for a few days. And then I sort of put a proposition on the table that may or may not describe what happened. But it's the best I can come up with. Or I go to my EDR vendor, I pull up Chris's laptop, look at it, go, that's exactly what he did. That's the position you need to be in. You need to shift up that value chain. I know I'm talking too much. I'm just because I'm drinking. You're, like, you're the person that should be talking, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you bring up a good good point here, Glenn. As, as we look at Obsidian and managing the, I'll say, business applications, because you pointed out Workaday, right? You and all these other uh, Salesforce, those are typically driven by your business units within companies. So that business infrastructure that's built in the cloud, that's great, but there's still, and you mentioned the EDR, right? There's still physical laptops traveling all around that are connecting back into the network infrastructure. There's still that whole network infrastructure and things that are going on there. So I did notice that you do have uh, integration to other tools, other SIM tools, for example, and then you also have an integration uh, with CrowdStrike. Can you talk a little bit more about those? Yeah, I mean, no, no man is an island, <laughs> um, you know, and no security tool should be. Um, and if you are, then you're you're wrong, because you you have to exist in an ecosystem. Chris is like winning himself laughing. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I came from the the previous iteration of McAfee that wanted to own everything, right? So. So there are ghost systems. I think to tell you the truth, today's ecosystem, granted, doesn't go completely in the cloud. The probably the, is is trends 
XDR, Trend Micro's XDR, is probably replacing the old McAfee is probably stacking. And I agree with you. Uh, you know, I always tell people, ask yourself, were you the kind of kid that had a boom box or a stereo system, right? Do you believe that one component can handle everything? And why did you have it? Was it because it was the best music? No, it's because you wanted to be different places and listen to your music. But a stereo, you know, a person that really loves music, right? They got an equalizer, a stereo system. They've got their, you know, a turntable because the the analog's better. And and that, I guess that's that's where you're getting at, right? That it may be no man's an island, but more importantly, no man knows everything, right? I mean, it's, teamwork is so important. I, I I made my kids watch a video on Arnold Schwarzenegger. I hope he he hasn't died yet, right? He's okay now. He's gone through like 20 bypass surgeries. Is is that you know he, he said I'm not a self-made man. You know when people tell me I'm a self-made man, I'm not. And he, he talks about all the people that helped him be who he was, and he wouldn't be where he was if it wasn't for those people. And I think that's so true that when you meet a company and it's all about one person, it's a lie, right? It's it's it, teamwork is so important, and it's not just teamwork inside a company. It's the fact, can a company be a team player with the people they interact with, right? And that's the reason why you're on this uh, podcast with us, right? Is that we really believe that there's traction in what you believe because you believe the same thing we do, right? We're going to figure a way to get to work together. But I agree with you. I don't think, not only No Man's an Island, I don't think no product should ever think it can do everything. And if there is somebody who tells you the product does run, run pretty quickly. <laughs> I, I agree. And, and that, that's, I, that's why that's my point. I mean, I, I was kind of worried you're going to get off the track there and go back to your underprivileged childhood and black and white TV. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I, thought, I, thought, I thought this was like going right down a, a rabbit hole when you started talking about your Walkman. Um, uh, I mean, I did have to watch the moon landing on a black and white TV. So it was... <laughs> I think they didn't have color back then. <laughs> no. it, was before, it was before they had pencils to color everything in. But, I know. Uh, but but you know, agree. Look, you 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 can't uh, you cannot structurally think that you can be the be all and end all from an ecosystem. So, as you think about how you have to interact and how you have to work together to secure an organization, it's well as we're pulling data, as we're providing this function for this part of your business, how can we interact with the tooling for the other parts of your business and help you take our data, mix it with other data, come together to, to create the view that you need, to create the, the cuts that you need on the data, to be able to give your team members the perspective to create their own cuts on the data um, and to be able to give them the perspective to understand the problems in their environment. You know, one, one of the things I sort of say is, look, you know, ultimately speaking, you know, you're dealing with, you're dealing with a very complex set of motivations on the other side of the table. And, you know, the motivations are what matter. So, you know, if you're, if you're a company and you're dealing with nation state attackers, you know, you're dealing with uh, infinitely deep pockets, highly trained, highly motivated opponents. The question is, is what group of opponents is that? Is that North Koreans that are doing it? So they don't get taken out the back and shot, or is that Russians that are doing it, you know, from a from 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 the nature of you know sort of nationalistic pride or whatever it happens to be, but then you're dealing with criminal attackers, or you're dealing with you know low grade criminal attackers, and and you know the the you, you cannot always understand the motivations of all your attackers, but being able to at least have some perspective. You know, if you go back a few years, and I, I, I don't mean this in any in any negative way at all, and it, it, it's certainly not meant in any negative way. This is just this sort of just deals with the motivation of attackers and the, and and the fluency and the fluidity of the attacker, which is you won't you go back a period of time and you everyone say, okay, you've got attackers in your environment for three hundred and seventy two days or five hundred and twenty six days or whatever the correct number in the Verizon database report was that that does this. Mm -hmm. and you have to be able to have tooling that allows you to find those attackers and hunt for those attackers and extract those attackers. 
And, you know, it's all about detection because you can't prevent. And then you get, then, then you get ransomware where the, the dwell time is instantaneous because what, what the, the motivation is different and the, the, the motivation from the attacker is different. And so they don't care about dwell time. It's, 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 it's the same as, 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 you know, the do the, the, the ransomware attacker is yeah. the person who sells shit on TV. They yeah, put their ad on TV. It up. I mean, do you think that's the reason why in the last breach report, they didn't talk about the all time is because ransomware that this, you know, they, they dropped the calculation so badly. They just didn't want people to, because they went from 260 days to not talking about it or 206 days. I'm sorry. to not talking about it. So I, I, I think it's, there's probably an element of it, but also I think that, you know, the dwell time thing was always a complex thing to actually really realistically calculate. Like, is it, is it 260 days because a piece of malware is there or is it 260 days because an attack is in your network and actually moving laterally and, and building in back doors? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a difficult question, you know, but, but, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a ransomware attacker, what you want to do is you want to get on TV, show them your sham wow, show it to a million people and hope a thousand buy it okay because then you've, you've made the return that you need right. if you're if you're a um if you're a nation state you're after five companies you're going to go after those five until you're in them and then you're going to stay in them well <laughs> this is fundamentally different and so the security teams have to think you know the security team still has to worry about a but they have to really think about B. So, so broadly, you know, obviously you're going to attach this to, to get back to the cloud, right? Because this well, it, it, it goes back to the, the same thing, which is how does one think about the security tooling? How does one think about the motivation of an attacker? And how does one think about, as you think about each of these attacker types, what are you concerned about? Are you concerned about ransomware? and you know, encryption of data and data loss, or are you concerned about criminals attempting to steal data from a, from a, to, to monetize it? Or are you concerned about nation states? Or are you concerned about all three? And depending on what you're doing, that's how you build your tooling. That's how you build the, the total totality of tooling. And it's how you build your teams because then you have threat hunting teams and you have incident response teams and you know, all, all these things come back. So, you know, the reason I went down that path was we were talking about tooling infrastructure and we're talking about the cooperation, the, the cooperation and the infrastructure is all built around which of your attackers you're dealing with and what their motivations are. And some people deal with all of them, you know, and some people deal with one of them and some people don't understand they're dealing with all of them, but they do deal with all of them. So is so, Obsidian going all the way to, to, to support, like, are you in full service? You're running everything and handling impact analysis and looking for who the attacker is, or are you just, where, where, where's the boundary yeah. of where you stop, number one? And number two, how your services, are they concierge style? Are you are you very what, open these guys out, or, or do you guys have like a product that's really definitive and it ends at this point? We're, we're a product, not a services company. Okay. So, you know, I think like, Chris, you provide services, you know, Jeremy, you provide services, you provide managed detection and response. Okay. What we say is we provide the tooling. So like Chris, you might manage, you know, Sentinel one or CrowdStrike on an endpoint. Well, we provide the cloud element of that and we give you the detection and response. And then we'll integrate with your CrowdStrike, you know, piece. We'll bring the CrowdStrike data in. We'll we'll use that CrowdStrike data to help identify attackers or problems in your in your environment. And then we'll forward that northbound so you can bring it into your broader tooling so you can actually hunt and, you know, and, and, and focus on, you know, your opponent. Did you, are you guys going to get to the point of implementing hunting in the tool? I mean, because there really is no really good cloud audit hunting tool out there right now, is there? I mean, that's what we are. Company, right? When you get bored of this one. Right, Jim, dude, 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 that's what we are now. Here, by the way. Yeah, Jeremy. What's, what's that? Sorry. You're not even drinking beer and you've been quiet. Well, well for, you're doing a lot of well, I, my, my beer is drink, my oh, beers dude. are gone. Uh oh. My wife told me I wanted to get, have one beer tonight. And secondly, so I've been that. having uh, latency issues with Zoom. So I've been freezing and 
coming back and forth. Regardless, I do have some questions Thank for you. Glenn. Wicker next time. I got to do the wicker guys. We're gonna do are the are do you consider yourself more a uh, more of a sim where you're taking all this data in and you're providing? Do you fit more in that category? Is that where is that where Obsidian is? Well, I mean, I think I think we fit more. Like, I mean, how do you think about a CrowdStrike? Is that a sim? That's an EPP EDR solution. Yeah, sure. yeah but I mean, how how do you think about the CrowdStrike management platform that manages it and the, gathers the, the you know yeah it, it, so you know that's more of what we are. We just don't necessarily have the endpoint because the things we're extracting data from are API driven rather than endpoint driven. Do you sort of see what I'm saying? Like, you're, so you're a you're a intelligence dashboard on top of this data. Well, we bring all the data together. We bring you know we we're focused on you know. Uh, Firstly, bringing together the visibility, then bringing, you know, breach detection. Can we identify breaches that are happening in your cloud environments? Can we find insiders? Can we help you with, you know, data leakage and data loss? And then posture management. So configurations, accounts, privileges. Because, you know, again, you know, like as you shifted to these environments, you shifted from a situation where let, let's say you had, you know, on-prem active directory it provided two functions. It provided authentication and it provided authorization. Okay, those are the two core functions that it provided. Well, when you shift to the cloud, you know, and you shift to file sharing inside 365, you, let's say you use Okta. Now you've got authentication from Okta, but you don't have that authorization piece anymore because th th that, 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 there's a break between those two core elements. And so, you know, you, you have this, proliferation, you have this monotonically increasing set of ability of your employees and your users to access and share data that never shrinks. Like the amount of data that you have access to on the first day of 365 just constantly increases as you use 365 because, you know, 10 years ago, if I'm inside, you know, a hospital system and I want to access the shared folder that has access to you know, that, that gives me access to the financial reports. I have to put a ticket in, they put me in an active directory group and then I get access. Well, now someone with access to that shared directory just gives it to me like right then and there. <laughs> and now I've got access to it, but what else do I have access to? And if I, am I accessing it? What am I doing with it? Like, you know, you got to answer all these questions. Um, so if we look at, if we look at AWS, Ignoring some of the more advanced uh, SaaS only products, but like Workday and, and, and Salesforce, but looking at like AWS, how do you differentiate yourself between uh, what like Cloud Checker can do or what native uh, Amazon tools can do? Well, I mean, you know, like if you're looking at an individual tool, then what, what you're effectively doing is shifting the responsibility to security to fundamentally understand every single platform that the organization has and understanding every single configuration set. And I'm going to go and run, you know, a configuration tool on AWS. I'm going to go run a different configuration tool on, you know, on, on Workday. I'm going to run a different configuration tool on, you know, on, on sure. G Suite. Or, that, that doesn't scale for security teams. That's fine, but not everybody has six or 10 or 12 or 20 different cloud platforms. Some people only have Amazon or some people only have GCP or, or, or Azure, right? So in that circumstance, when I have a single, like I have a single uh, Amazon relationship where I put all my stuff out there, how does, how do you, why would I use your tool versus somebody else's in that scenario? Yeah because you're not only going to have Amazon, you may have just that as infrastructure as a service, but then you're still going to have 365. You're still going to have Salesforce. You're still going to have Box or what? I, I would argue that there are more companies that don't have those tools than do. I mean, at this point, there are, you know, to, to start with, obviously like, you know, my, my purpose is not to solve world hunger. My purpose is to, you know, is to is to is to solve tooling for companies that have the problem set that I'm that I'm okay. solving for, and okay. and realistically, realistically speaking, um, uh, I don't run into too many companies that don't have a combination of those things. In fact, if anything, most companies I run into 
don't have five or six platforms, they have 60 or 70. Um, and so, you know, the, the problem is very rarely that I've got just AWS and nothing else. The problem is more likely, you know, I mean, I mean, hell, Jeremy, I, I've got customers that have got eight different Salesforce instances, eight, just sure. Salesforce. Sure. Not, not, eight, not eight different SaaS apps, just eight Salesforce instances. Plus, if you, you know, I've, I've gone out and read some reviews recently that, and I know MIT did one and, and, and others have said that the expectation was that the cloud adoption would actually slow down during COVID, but that it's really accelerated. Uh, and they expect that acceleration to continue even after we get, you know, all the vaccines and stuff. Well, I, would, so I, I think that's a huge growing it's, space. Well, it's the only resiliency model we have as, as, as business owners is being able to move our people around without having to have, bring everybody together under a common roof, right? That's how our, our, our personally, our company is that way, where, we're kind of completely distributed workforce. Even our SOC is distributed. We don't have a common building that everybody goes into. We have a common set of tooling that we all use, <clears throat> work workflows and processes and things like that. Uh, and it's all instrumented so we can log everything. But it's not, I think the, in a lot of the companies, uh, this model, this new work from home model is gonna become a norm as opposed to at some point going back yeah, that, that makes me wonder, um, Glenn, is your product uh, multi-tenant based such that MSSPs which, such as Jeremy can use your product for multiple clients? I mean, it, it, it's already built that way. So, okay. I mean, people like Jeremy can take it and go manage 20 people. Got it. But, and it's very API driven and all of those things. You know, and, and part of that is, you know, that's part of the fun of having done this once before. It's like, hey, here are all the things we didn't think about the first time we built something. We didn't think about people like Jeremy. And then when someone like Jeremy turned up to science and said, hey, I want to manage your instances. We're like, well, that's really hard. Um, and let's try and like reverse engineer that. Let's try and work out how to fix it for you. And you know, you, you watch people like Jeremy's like grind their teeth and want to punch us in the nose. Um, so, so, you know. Pioneer. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, um, dude, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's a combination. Look, I think to start with, I think it's, it's fundamentally important for people, it, you know, there is a cost involved in going to SaaS. And I think Jeremy at one stage, like much earlier in the conversation, when I made a comment about 365, you said, ah, oh, but it's expensive. I, I think there's a cost involved, but for small businesses, I don't think there's any way to beat it. For medium businesses, I don't think there's any way to beat it. And for large businesses, it's a cost of doing business. It just, you know, it, you sit down and, and if anything, if you're the CFO of a large business and you can sit down and go, I can predictably tell what my IT costs are gonna be because I pay Microsoft 20 bucks, Salesforce 10 bucks, Workday five bucks, you know, and I add this up and I go, it's gonna cost me, you know, $220 a month in sales in, in, in IT costs for every employee. That's a CFO's dream. Yeah, and you know okay. what? I, I agree that, that that's another part we really haven't talked about, clients, is that I think that that the industry has significantly changed between the MSSP and the MDR. I mean, the MDR, Jeremy and I have talked about this extensively. The MDR has to price by person. It can no longer say how many gigs of data do you really use? Uh, you know, you can't be going through all these calculations. You have to be able to say by devices or seats, how much you're gonna cost. I can't say EPS. I mean, there's, it's ridiculous, right? With the way, the way SIMs are priced today, it, it's, it's stupid. I mean, absolutely well, stupid. But uh, I, I agree. I mean, I think you have to price. You have to price how the business thinks about its cost basis. Okay, and otherwise, what you're doing is you're putting the CEO in an unscalable, so the CSO or the or the C CSO in in a, in a in an unscalable situation. Then how they deal with the CFO, because they go into the CFO and having a conversation. It's like, well, the upfront cost is X, but the scaling costs are variable, and the CFO is like, I I don't want to deal with that. Like I have pr predictability in my cost. If, if I'm going to hire a hundred people, I know how much it's going to cost me in office space. I know how much it's going to cost me in insurance. I know it's going to cost me in everything. If I hire a hundred people and my IT team is telling me it could cost me, you know, 
X plus variable percentage, like that's not, that's not a way of doing business. And, and that's part of the reason why a lot of the SaaS model works is you may be wearing an additional cost, yeah. but you're getting rid of so many hidden costs that it becomes more predictable and manageable. I agree and, very much. It, 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 just maintenance alone on, on products instead of keeping them on-prem, right? To, okay. to move into the cloud. And then an execution of shelfware. You don't have shelfware. You know, you're not, you're not buying, you know, you're not buying a new tool and then going to spend two years implementing it. Uh, yeah. I, think both you, I mean, let me ask you this almost on the same type of topic. So obviously what we're talking about here is a little bit more cutting edge than like if you, you were trying to sell this 10 years ago, people would think you're, you know, you're crazy, right? It's, it's fairly cutting edge right now. And one thing I find, because all my life I've been more closer to the edge of, of what's coming around the corner. And, and I always find it interesting that when you go, I know I'm onto something on the cutting edge when I when I talk to someone that says, well, I'm building it myself, right? <laughs> I've got Panther, I've got Elastic, and I'm gonna pull all this data, I'm gonna create this thing myself, right? Um, I mean, how do you, how are you educating customers to, to make that mental leap to understand that what you're saying, like you can talk to Jeremy and I now, it, it, we're in the industry, we get it. I mean, we get it from day one, but, but have you been, it, or how's the reception going outside of the industry? When you talk to people, I mean, do, are you running into people who are trying to build it themselves? Are you trying to, are you running into people that say, I can get open source to do this or, or I can figure it out or, you know, Microsoft will take care of me. I don't need to see the logs. I mean, how many people actually, how many clients that you run into actually look at their own Zoom logs? prior to meeting you? <laughs> um, there is, look, you and Jeremy probably encounter this a lot. You know, we encounter this, which is, you know, one of the good things that happened in the last 10 years is security teams became engineering teams. I actually consider that a positive. You know, that's a positive thing. That, like, it's an engineering mindset from the security team and they, they come at a problem from an engineering perspective rather than a, you know, that, there's important things security has to worry about. It has to worry about compliance and it has to worry about all those sort of basic structural elements that there has to be people there to do those things, okay? Because it's part of the business, it's part of keeping the business safe, it's part of keeping the employees and you know their data and their customers safe. And like, you know, ultimately that's, if you're in security, what you actually care about is protecting people. Yeah. Otherwise you should go do something else. Like, you know, if you're in it for the money, go do something else. Um, but if you care about protecting people, you know, you get these teams that have an engineering mindset, then I actually think that's somewhat easier to deal with because, you know, I've never run into a security team that's got one thing on their mind. So if I can go to the security team and have the same conversation we just had about the CFO and the CISO, which is, look, you're going to try and build this. You're going to grab 10 things together. You're going to spend these headcount on it. If you let me do this piece of it, then you can go focus on the other nine things that are scaring the crap out of you. And if there isn't a solution for those other nine things, then you truly are needed over there. You're not needed here. Let me perform this function. You know, I mean, I can go build my own, if I'm a CISO of a company, I can go build my own endpoint, but that is not an effective use of my time or my engineering effort. What, and, what, and what? Sorry, go ahead. I was thinking because you're going down that route and you got the guys building yourselves and you, I definitely get it, right? Building yourself sucks. But then you get a guy who's been certified in Splunk or certified in, I don't know, X or Y or Z. And they say, you know what? I can do this using this tool. I can just pull it down and I can throw it on my Elastic or my Splunk or my Q radar, you know, or Arctic Wolf comes in and say, hey, we can do it. I mean, where's the differentiator from the SIM group that says, this is no different than a device. I can just pull it in and pull it into the SIM and review it that way. But what do you think about those people, the mindset that, that the cloud is no different than the server that you have on prem? It's a I mean, data source, right? Yeah. From, from, from one standpoint, but it's, a, it's an expansion of your attack surface, which is where Obsidian probably shines. Right. 
Well, yeah, exactly. You're giving you that visibility. But how I mean, if you're dealing with a guy who's got a certification and he knows his certification no longer is valid the second Obsidian shows up. So you get this person who's going Somebody's still got to use the app. Someone's still got to review yeah. the data coming out of Obsidian. So that person isn't necessarily useless. Yeah, but they're sure. What you've done is you've taken his time <laughs> and you've refocused it, right? You've yeah. made him more efficient by providing tooling that gives him the data the right yeah. data. Yeah, and, and you know, you know right. what we're getting at, Jeremy, is I'm kind of arguing in the sense of, 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 there's people that look at it and they look at it and they say, I'll give you a statement I really hate. The cloud is somebody else's computer. I think that's some yeah. of shit, and I just said the shit word, so I guess we have to do a, a little 13 requirement or something on this. It's already on there. Oh, uh, good. So, so the point is, is that, you know, People are going to think it's there's no difference between this and a sim, and all you're doing is trying to tell me that you're basically a SaaS sim. But why would I get you if if there's been you know the old standbys are just as good? I mean, I mean, and and to add to that question, Glenn, how I, is your what is your response? How does you know you you how the ability to respond to things with your tooling as a pseudo cloud EDR? What the what does your response capability include? That's exactly right. So 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 you think about it this way, Glenn. There's somebody there who says my sim solves everything. And trust me, a sim does solve everything. It can even order me toilet paper when 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 I can't get toilet paper at Costco. But how do you respond to those people to to tr clearly articulate? I don't know that they're on the wrong planet. I mean, oh, it it, it again. It, so let me let me let me restructure this a little bit. I, I mean, I, I get the nature of your question, and, and the nature of your question is some of the restivity. Re, re, restivity uh, uh, well, first of all, I can't believe that that's the first time anyone swore on this podcast because as an Australian, I, I'm, I'm almost offended that I haven't sworn already. But you know, a, a, as you run into sort of this resistance that you get from 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 different people, you, you know, it's like, well, can I do this in this way? And, and, and the answer is, well, you can't because you end up with some of the same problems that where you started out this conversation, like, well, I want to look at logs. Well, these aren't logs. These are APIs. And there's a richness of APIs and there's a number of them. And that this isn't, this isn't syslog. And, and as, you, as you move away from that syslog mindset, then you start to understand that you have a more complex sort of set of problems. And as I said, it starts with configuration, accounts, privileges, access, data, activity, detections. This is, this is a substantive amount of, of information. You know, the first question I would say to someone is, well, you know, I can just Windows log off your endpoint. Are you gonna run that into your SIM? Well, obviously you're not. Why aren't you? Because the depth and richness of the data are the first point interpretation, normalizing the data is the second point. And then, then the detections and, and the response is the, is the next piece. So because these are APIs, the APIs are bi-directional. You can reach in, you can take actions, you can do things. This, the SIM does not solve problems. You know, we had a problem back in 2008. Security teams didn't have data to understand what was going on. So we started building data lakes. We started thinking about things like SIMs. And, th and that was great. That was an incremental improvement in 2008. It's 12 years later. You know, having access to data is important to make decisions, but you know, we don't take every piece of data that one gets from a medical exam and throw it into an unstructured data lake and hope we get some sort of insight as to your health. You know, that isn't a good decision-making process. That isn't a good way to think about information and how one uses information to make good decisions. And ultimately that's what we're trying to do in security. We have information sources. We take that information, we structure it in ways that we can utilize it. So we can identify problems. We identify problems based on, 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 on these attacker scenarios that we talked about and the motivations of them and the problem sets we have, 
We use that to understand the data sets that we have and where the information it is that we have as a business is located, how that data is protected. And then we bring all that together to put a security function around it that helps us protect, detect, and respond to the organization. And shoving everything into a data lake does not fix this problem. I appreciate that. Now, now, now Jeremy, you were going down the response part, which we haven't even touched. And I think that'd be another year of drinking as we figure that one out. Um, I, I may have to go back for another can because I did have my wife bring me a different beer. You do it up on the Cobra? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! That was... I, I don't think I, I don't think I actually saw him drink the Cobra after the start. I think he he, he drank a little bit and was like, "No." It, it was one out. taste, and that was that. I'm out. <laughs> that stuff is horrible. Agreed. I mean, <laughs> it's gross. That's a so, but, but, but Glenn, what is your what is your platform's response capability yeah. as a CDR? We we got we understand all the detection that you're capable yeah. of doing now, but what's your response? So that's the ability to reach back in and suspend accounts and unshare files and change, you know, change access and change configurations. All of those things come. Now, there is going to be variance, as we said, around the APIs, because some of these concepts exist differently in some of these in applications. But those are the capabilities you need in the response element. Is it autonomous or is it is it human require is a human interaction required? Uh, is it rule based? Generally, we 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 have human in the loop on a lot of the response elements. Yes. I mean, do you call it a CDR? It is a cloud detection and response. Yeah, yeah. you pull that out of your head right now, or is that that? Uh, no, it's it's on their web page. Yeah, he, he read it. He, he read it. He, he read it off my web page, Chris. That, that shows you that I mean, as a good and close. I've heard anybody call it a CDR, but I, as as a good and close friend of mine, you obviously looked at my website carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the reason why we have this talk right now. I, I, I'm too slow to read. My brains don't work that way. So I, mean, I, I did see that. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if if you were included in that, Glenn, but Ben did get uh, the 2020 Global Technology Executives Who Matter uh, award or recognition back in September. Yeah, I, I think you know. I mean, I, I often say he did it all, Glenn. He said that. Really, he's been driving his company and dragging the other guy along. It says something I mean, about you right. holding him back. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he's right, you know. There's a reason why I refer to him as my better half. Um, you know, he, he's, he's, a, he's a high quality human being. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, last time I logged on, it said that Obsidian's coming soon. We, we're in secret, secret mode. Yeah, I mean, dude, that that was like two and a half years ago. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, now you know where Chris is at on his timeline. So, <laughs> I, I mean, we were we were commenting earlier on his prehensive for black and white television. Obviously, the, uh, <laughs> the, the the cognition has slowed down appropriately. Um, so, yeah. so uh, trying to make this a serious conversation for a moment. Okay. What's it like working with Greylock and some of your other VC partners? Uh, it's it's actually really yeah, it, it's one of the benefits of working with smart people that have a broad perspective across a number of things is that they can have and bring to you a really interesting set of ideas and um, solutions to problems that you wouldn't necessarily just run into yourself. Some of that is individually they are incredibly gifted intellectually and some of that is they have incredible experience so when you're dealing with someone like you know Ashim Chan or Greylock or Sarah Go at, at Greylock or Gaurav Garg at, at Wing you know or Tyson Clark at GV you know these are people that have started their own companies that have taken companies public that have built products that have um, you know, performed this incredible variety of different things in their careers. And um, you know, that the reason we seek out people like this for conversations is we, you know, there's, there's four different people here with four different backgrounds that have got four different sets of experience. You know, what Greylock or Wing or GV does is that they go and find 
people that have this diverse set of experience and capability and then they bring them together and they create a partnership. And then when you work with them, you have access to those people and you have access to the, their learnings and their experience and their capabilities and their networks. And when you want to solve a problem or you, you know, you think you've got a great idea, you can go to them and you can speak to them they can, and they can, they can pick it apart for you. Hmm. The same way you can with, with, with close friends and colleagues, but they can do it from, from a totally different perspective and they do it in a different way. And they, they can hold you accountable for how you should be doing things and for the level you should be achieving. And, and they can hold you accountable and they can help you set standards for yourself and for your team. And, 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 and you know, it, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, a, it, it's actually quite a great experience. You know, at Science, you know, we got to work with um, people like Vinod Kosler and, you know, we got to work with, um, you know, uh, people like Clear Sky and, and, and DSJ. And, you know, th these, were, these were great firms and I've got to work with a different set. And so you, you get to meet this incredible group of people. Um, uh, and I mean, I know that VC can get, you know, can get, can get uh, uh, a lot of flack, but realistically, um, the ones that I've dealt with are being, you know, some of the more remarkable people you'll ever meet. How long do you plan to be in the organization? Are you looking to build a long-term company or are you looking to IPO? What's, what's the long-term strategy for Obsidian? Yeah, I mean, we, if, we, if you can tell us. I mean, we built this to build a business. So, you know, we want to build a business. Like we like working together. We like working with the people we got on the board. We want to be here in, you know, another 10 years. Now, now I mean, I don't know, dude, like we have pandemics and earthquakes and fires and, you know, like, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm an, I'm an immigrant. I could get deported. I don't know, you know, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> but, but, but realistically, um, you know, we want to be in it for, for the long term, and we, we sort of chose people that, that think the same way. And my last important question, and then we'll let Chris ask his silly questions. Thank you. Ducks or Kings? You're behind the orange curtain down there. Are you a Duck fan or a Kings fan? There's only one right answer. Yeah, I mean, there is only one right answer, but I mean, I, I the kids the, the kids have always taken the Kings them. Look at the banners behind them. Oh, no, no, I, I, I just said the Kings have always taken There's two of them. I do, I do, I do, I do love a Kings game. The, 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 the enthusiasm in the crowd is, is, is fabulous. Um, although I do go to a lot of Angels games, so that's a contradiction. That's a good choice. That's a good choice. Um, oh, and Footy, are you a Blues fan, or did you actually get it like a team that wins? <laughs> just, just wondering. <laughs> and and with that, gentlemen, we are really <laughs> at, at the end of our hour here. So um, thank you, thank you. So Thanks, listen, everyone. thank you, Glad. I appreciate it. We do want to say thank you. I, I learned a lot personally, and I appreciate yeah. that. That's, that's a good conversation. That's the one thing I always look forward to every day is trying to learn something new, and it it is good. And you know, awesome. wish you guys all the best and and lots of success. From my side, awesome hanging out with you guys. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I can't wait till COVID's over and we can all actually see each other face to face. It'll be, be fun. nice. And I'll buy you a real beer. Yeah. All right, Chris, you can turn the recording off now. <laughs> Speaking of real beer, I hold on, hold on. I got to give a plug to my friends here at Bravery Brewing because I thought this was going to be disgusting, to be honest with you. But this Baltic Porter is amazing. So it's coffee, please. it's whiskey, and it's beer all at the same time. And it's can you, can you get a link to that and see if I can't order it from where I am? Yeah, for sure. It'll be on the uh, on the page. All right, all right, we'll get on the page. All right, bye, everybody. We just don't leave. I'm just going to turn off the recording button. I got to find a thing. Stop. Pause.